Man Had a Show podcast with a very special guest. I've worked with her. I've seen her grow. Have I, yeah, I've seen her. Well, I don't know if I've seen you grow. i just seen you. I see you as an incredible black woman doing her thing. I appreciate so that. So I think I get a bird's eye view of watching you. I don't know if that's watching you grow, though, because you were already grown by the time you got to me. You was already moving and shaking on a very high level. An and evolution, maybe, of sorts. Have Maybe you because that? you're going into movies now. So we got yeah. to talk about that, too. But I want to go back to our beginning. I actually met Miss Holly. Holly Charles Pearson. She got married. I got married, yeah. So, you know, you got to put that Pearson on there so homeboy <laughs> know he being represented, too. But I met her when we first started to vibe. And mm-hmm. she became our promotions director. And she was a PR person, mm-hmm. but not necessarily in radio, on in radio promotions. And I think that's what made you great. And we didn't get a chance to work together for a long time, but everything you were doing was spot on. Like when you walked in the building today, everybody's like, oh, Holly's here. (laughs) They had that little like, will you come? No, you're not coming. (laughs) But you you were incredible. I mean, but the way you think about things are different. And I think that's what made it exciting to work with you. Like I I know if you would have stayed here these three years and we would have made it through COVID and all that. The vibe is really a radio station in a different place just because the way you think and the way you move and you you move like you move like everything you do. You're doing it for TV or a movie. That's (laughs) that's the way you move in life. You know, like, oh, how do I move? You know, I'm living in Houston and I'm living in this city over here. You know, you're just always moving around. But I just want to say that it's just been marvelous to work with you. You're an incredible black woman doing her thing. And I'm so proud to call you a friend. And every time that I've needed you, not one time did like, here it is. No. Not at all. You'll come with 32 ideas. Because I'm going to tell you all this one short story (laughs) and then we're going to move on. I'm like, hey, Miss Holly, I need you to do a, a, a one sheet for me. She's like, what you promoting? I said, I just got promoted at my job. And what else? (laughs) That's me. I said, well, I got promoted. What's the story, (laughs) Hatter? Who cares? (laughs) I thought I, I thought I ch- achieved something, but maybe love. I did not. <laughs> so after I picked my face up, she started running through. How do you got to do things like da 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 da? I'm like, man, I'm just out here living, man. Mm-hmm. So she always has all these ideas. So that's what I really love about you, because you 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 just honest. You like, uh, people get jobs every day, bro. What else? <laughs> what we gonna add to that? You're right. Let me go back to the drawing board on this one, right? But you gave me some great ideas. That's why I'm doing the scholarship that I'm doing right now because of you. You had this incredible idea. It's been changed about 62 times, but the the idea and theme is all Holly, so I got to say that. So thank you so much for that. You've been an an incredible friend, and it's just fun watching you grow. Aside from all that, before you even got to me doing PR, you you were doing plays. Mm-hmm. So you were already accomplished at writing and producing plays. Mm-hmm. Let's go back there real quick, sure. and then we'll jump to what's going on right now. Sure. What was that play? What was that all about? What got you started even doing that? So, so uh, first, let me say thank you, and I appreciate your friendship. I appreciate your professionalism and just... Um, This is, you know, from relationships, what I'm doing right now is it comes from relationships like people like you and um, Misty Blue Media. There's Misty Starks, who I worked for, and that's where I learned a lot of my PR skills. I want to be very careful about um, paying homage to the black woman who taught me how to do everything that you're saying that you appreciate. But um, to go back to it, I'm a storyteller. My grandmother was a storyteller. Mm -hmm. Both of my grandmothers were storytellers, and so... I really, really love to be able to bring people together by sharing stories. And so I was teaching English for about 15 years. Mm. Um, But I had gone to college originally for telecommunications, so production and writing. And these are things I'm not even sure that I told you, but I went to Purdue because I wanted to tell great stories. Like Mm -hmm. I was like obsessed with Mara Brock Akil and the black women that I aspire to be were the girls on Girlfriends, Mm -hmm. right? And so I started paying attention to the power of storytelling and how they make you reflect, how they make you feel like you're not alone, how they bring people together. And then even most especially like literary activism, how there there are ways to seek justice by telling someone's story Mm -hmm. and then creating empathy and making changes because of it. And so I was just, and that's why I love like a different world and things like that. So I am just a storyteller. But I think life happens. And so I was teaching English and I was teaching kids how to tell stories. And I started teaching African-American studies and I did a little bit at U of H. And so I was teaching everyone else how to how to write. 
how to tell a story, how to um, make people feel seen with your words. And so when I went back to, I went to PV um, to get my master's so that I could teach dual credit classes. And I thought that was strictly like, that was an English teacher thing. Like, I'm, I just want to make a little bit more money, teach a few different classes. Mm-hmm. And so I get this master's. But at the end of the program, they said, hey, you can write a creative thesis and go into six months of independent study instead of taking this last semester of classes. And that was really attractive to me. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> and not even just that I wanted to stay at home. I think a lot of it was whenever you add creative to the top of anything, what you're saying is that you're giving me autonomy to share something that I think is important. Mm-hmm. And so what's really important to me uh, is my culture. I'm so excited and happy, and every day I wake up excited to be a black woman, to a black woman on this soil in particular. I love telling those stories, and I love my mother. I love my grandmother. And so I was thinking, what can I tell about my female lineage? And I ended up writing for my creative thesis about my female lineage from 1918 to present. Oh, wow. And so... That yeah, I ain't thesis. never heard this story yeah. right here. I'm learning something <laughs> We're right always now, talking yeah. about something else. Yeah. Um, but that thesis was called Velvet, uh, The Burden of Melanin and Motherhood. And so it talked about generational curses and the evolving views of like womanhood and motherhood, specifically for black women on this soil. Mm-hmm. What it looks like to be under patriarchy and racism at the same time. Mm-hmm. How oppressive that is. And then how do you also tell your daughter how to um, value herself when the world sometimes does not. Mm-hmm. And so I wrote this thing that was supposed to be for a grade and my professors during my defense because you have to sit through a defense panel they you know we got through it and they kind of stopped they said okay we're done and but you know I thought I should walk out the room and they were like what what, off the record what what are you what are you doing and I said I'm gonna graduate right and they kind of laughed and they said no like what are you doing with this it can't just be a grade And I just needed that validation to say, like, you can go back to where you were, Holly, when you graduated from Purdue. You can start again. They really encouraged me that Hmm. the stories were worth telling. And so before the end of that year, I published that as a book, and it's called Velvet. And so that's something that's available everywhere. And since then, I just never stopped telling stories that I knew mattered. Mm. And so I ended up being in the Houston Black Leadership Institute Um, Shout out to HBLI. Um, And it changed my life because they gave me more stories. They taught me about Freedmanstown, the largest ex-slave settlement in the United States right here in Fourth Ward, Houston. And I met all these people and I realized if God gave me this gift to tell stories, how do I use that to move people and move culture? How do I, you know, like your ministry is in serving God because I'm a a Christian. I'm very bold about, about my beliefs. Serving God has to do with you really, really diving into your personal ministry. And for me, what God gave me was the ability to write and to tell stories. And mm-hmm. so I thought, how do I how do I use that? And so I started going down to Freeman's Town like crazy. I was like a roach that wouldn't leave, right? Like I just, <laughs> I literally, I showed up to everything in Freeman's Town. And they would just be like, who is this young lady? And you know, I'm from the Chicago area, so I didn't have any roots there. And they were just like, why is she always here? And I thought, maybe I could write something that will raise money and awareness at the same time. Like maybe I could share this story in such a way that we could raise money and then I could in turn, you know, amplify the stories of my people. And so I showed up for about a year. I met with every historian that you could think. I just I just kept showing up. And then I wrote this stage play called In All By Getting, The Forgotten Story of Freedman's Town. And then I started meeting with folks and partnering with people because you can't do it on your own. Mm. And I had groups to buy out shows six months in advance. And we essentially had at the Ensemble Theater, we had almost five shows that just sold out over over Juneteenth weekend. Wow. And so I thought it was a one-time thing. And we donated thousands of dollars to, you know, to Freedman's Town and all of that. I was excited about it. But people kept saying, what's the next thing? They said, what are you going to do? <laughs> and I was like, oh, no, I was going to go write another book. I was going to go sit, you know, like a hermit and be by myself. And they were like... People just kept saying it. And then I started coming up with this excuse. Well, I'm not going to just write about anything. It has to be, like, purposeful. And then God just put it on my heart that, you know, this it has to be plays on purpose. Maybe that's what you do. Mm. Maybe it's literary activism by telling stories. Like, I'm not the smartest person in the room, but if I can tell the story that then inspires the person with the money or the person with the plan, then that's my, that's my part. That's Absolutely. what I do. And so I ended up creating Houston Play on Purpose. 
which is a nonprofit theater company, no brick and mortar. We literally would go once a summer, rent out a theater for the weekend, and we would find purpose in some marginalized community whose story needed to be told. And so the next year, it was I'm Still a Woman. It was about infertility and women of color. Mm. That's super taboo, right? Mm. The next year, I did a stage play called um, Black, White, and Sunshine. And that was about, you know, how black and brown children are just kind of funneled into the juvenile justice and child welfare systems. Did you ever videotape any of these? Yes, yeah. Oh. Yes, and I, I can... You yeah. thought I would ask. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know but, you got your buddy but, back but there. Now, and so I'm The queen glad. of photography <laughs> and video and visuals. Miss Angeline, yes. Um, and so I did do all that, but it was all informal, and for the most part, it was about, the, you know, like feeling it, like being in the space. Mm -hmm, I guess. In the back of my mind, yeah, I always wanted to go back to film, go back to, you know, that thing, right? Mm -hmm. But I think I, I got, I don't want to say stuck in a cycle because I was blessed to be there. But I think COVID really, it changed the game. And I think those few years where I couldn't produce a play, because there was another play called Blue Spectrum that we were gearing up for, and that was about uh, veterans, particularly African-American veterans who were kind of like lost when they come back mm -hmm. and just looking at mental health and things like that. And so I felt like something was taken from me you know, like a lot of creatives during that time, you know, so this gift, this thing that I was giving back to the world, like, was it not good enough? What's going on? And then after COVID ended, everybody thought that we would just jump back into life. And that didn't happen. Right. You know, and so contacts were lost. Things changed. You know, everything was different. Mm. And I was kind of, you know, in this, you know, God, why have thou forsaken me? <laughs> like I was in this, you know what I'm saying? I'm sure my husband was you. tired of hearing me say it. He was supportive. But I mean, I'm, at some point, you know, I was just writing and writing and writing, and I did that all through the pandemic. I wrote more during the pandemic than I probably had in the last 10 years mm. because I was producing a play every year. So you can't write, produce, and direct the play every year and then also find time to write screenplays. So I didn't have anything else to do, and so for three years I learned the correct software, you know, final drafts. So I could, you know, work on plays. I applied to a lot of writing fellowships that I got denied to, every mm. one of them. But every single time you had to learn a new set of skills. Mm -hmm. And so I just constantly wrote. And I was frustrated at the end of that time. And then finally it just was like the Holy Spirit, like, just tapped me on the shoulder and was like, that play, that last play that you were supposed to do before the world shut down, you still have the funds for it. Why aren't you betting on yourself? Mm. And so that was when I realized, you know what? That's what I had to do with the stage plays. You have a story to tell. Stop begging people to tell it. Mm. You have that right mm. to do it. And so I started, you know, I joined the, the film society. I started um, taking pre-production courses. I started reaching out. Um, I don't you know, know how you do people. all the stuff that you do. <laughs> I, We've had these conversations. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, at, at night when my family is snoring, I figure it out. And I didn't know if that was going to work either. Mm -hmm. But um, I really believe that no time is wasted if you ain't wasting it. I really, really believe that if you just continue to do what you love and what you would do for free anyway, then you're always building your skills. So I personally feel like the pandemic was three years of God, like setting aside time for me to be schooled. Because during that time, I, I networked with a lot of people that I needed for the, you know, for this a time like such as this. Mm -hmm. um, I had to learn the correct sophomore, I had to, or a uh, software. I had to learn how to write in various forms. So for three years, God created a school for me, and you know there was frustration, and now I get it. And so once, once I really like submitted to that. That no, you can do this. Well, it seems like it's moving fast it's now, moving though. Very fast, and probably because of the down period, as you call it. Yeah, you know. Yeah. But it seems like because every time I talk to, you, oh man, we doing da 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 da. Like, yeah. I don't know how she's keeping up with all this. Yeah. And by the and by the way, and, and um, all of what you're doing is now you're taking, uh, you're going from the play world to the motion picture world. Motion picture world. What yeah. what gave you the audacity to say, you mm -hmm. know what, I'll just make a movie. I mean. Look, if if you think about the big picture, because when, when someone says, I, I want to make a movie, that sounds like it just it sounds too big and it sounds like too much. And, and I think that's probably where I was, too. I was comfortable with the stage plays and they were successful and I knew I was doing something good. A movie sounded like a lot, but I'm capable of doing at least one thing a day. 
Okay. So so it's like like why am I worried about the movie when when I need to be writing the press release? Why am I worried about the movie when what I really need to be doing is finding movie stills so I can put my pitch deck together? Why am I worried about the movie when what I need to be doing is learning the software so that I can go ahead and tell this story? Why am I worried about the movie when this is about research to make sure that everything is historically accurate? Like, mm. I can do those things. And so if we stop thinking about the big picture and think about all the things that go into it, you'll become an expert of what it is that you need to do. And so it's just about, like, trusting the process. I mean, it doesn't mean that you don't give yourself deadlines or that, you you know, like, you know me, I'm very deadline-driven. Yeah. Yes, you are. Um, I'm all about a schedule. But every single day. So I have a, a planner where I, when I taught her, I would write things down every single day. And I didn't care if it was that I needed to eat a banana, a banana <laughs> for the day. Like every single thing that I needed to do, if it was one little thing, I was going to get it done in a day. And if everyone could just figure out what to do with those 24 hours, but then do that 365 days a year, you'd be surprised what you what come you up with. I, I dig that. I dig that. So you are definitely... Further down the road, I, last I talked to you, you were looking for spots where you're going to be shooting. And yeah. and what is this movie? Is it one of the plays? So it is one of the plays that you're taking it's motion picture actually. or is this yeah. brand new concept and idea? So that's a great question. So it's a brand new concept and idea. I, I've discussed a couple, you know, a couple minutes ago about like the various plays, no matter what. It's always going to be purposeful. Right. I consider myself not just a writer. I really consider myself a literary activist. Okay. Because it's always, if, if you think there's an agenda, if you think there's something behind it, there always is. Because why, am I, why else am I writing? So I'm okay with you being entertained and, and informed at the same time. And so uh, during the pandemic, I was thinking about a lot of research that I had done, um, particularly about African Americans who had gone back to Africa um, at the end of slavery, right? So after the proclama- Emancipation Proclamation was signed, there were about 15,000 uh, people who were formerly enslaved who went back to Liberia. And so I started thinking about that, and I started thinking about Marcus Garvey and the Back to Africa movement and the Black Star Line, and I started asking myself questions about what would not just the United States look like, but what would the world look like if they had taken all of us back? Mm. If four million formerly enslaved, disenfranchised, marginalized, uneducated— not because they were um, incapable, but because they were, you know, you know that that was what they were directed not to do. Right. Um, what would the world look like? And so that set me on this like maybe six months like of just writing every single night. You know, my husband snoring in the bed next to me, just writing and coming up with this concept and telling this story. Not just so that we could imagine this world, but so that we could talk about things in a different light, things like reparations and talk about systemic oppression and talk about the lack of accountability and talk about apathy and talk about, you know, all of these different things. How would we look at them? How would the world look at us? Mm -hmm. And so I came up with the concept, if they took us back. And so when I first wrote it, it was really long. In my mind, I was like, this would be a limited series or a feature film. And, you know, I had all these big ideas, but realistically, God had given me enough for this. And that can be enough. Like he'd given me enough to do something smaller. And so I adapted that down. Once I got the vision that I needed to do it myself. So what will the smaller version of this be? So this will be, and that's a great question. It's a live action short. So it's a short film and it'll be about 20 minutes. So a short um, in film festival talk, it can be anything from two minutes to 40 minutes. After 40 minutes, it becomes a feature film. Mm. And so a 20 minute film not only was um, right where I probably am as far as just what I needed to do, but like budget wise, I thought, oh, I got enough for a short. Yeah, because the concept sounds huge. It does. And so we had to, it was kind of, that was really, that was a lot shrinking it down. And so I kind of got a little discouraged with trying to shrink it down, but I found like a really healthy compromise. And I, I tell people like, this movie is not going to, this short film, it's not going to answer any questions. Mm. We can't anyway. Everything is, is hypothetical that we're talking about in this sequence. It's only going to um, present you with new questions. And those questions are supposed to help people to reflect and to have conversations about things um, that connect us. Okay, I'm excited about it. I am too. I don't know if I'm more excited than you, <laughs> but I'm excited about it. It's, it's great to see somebody have a vision mm-hmm. and you're one of those people, you're going to play it out until the end. Mm-hmm. 
I love that about you. So so I'm I'm excited to see the in process because I know it's coming yeah. every time I talk to you. Oh yeah, we looking, we scouting this and we doing <laughs> that. We I, I I know it's big time. I know you're doing your thing big time. Do you, do you? Let me know when you're done. Let yeah. me know when you're done yeah. so I can be there and watch the whole yeah. thing. Oh, if people want to be a part of it, if yeah. they want to participate, if they want to also because it's a foundation. Sure. So they can obviously uh give unto you, so to speak? Absolutely. Uh, how can they do all those things? So there's a few different things. So, of course, if there's anyone who ever wanted to donate to the project, you would donate directly to Houston Play on Purpose, which is our fiscal sponsor for the short film. And so you could just go to uh, HoustonPlayOnPurpose.com and make a donation there. But we also, this is one my, I'm so excited about this part of the project. I love employing black actors. Like, that's... That's a part of the joy of it all, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's like you're looking at this part of justice. You know, I'm trying to like, you know, justice fulfilled here. But there's also this these opportunities that we give for people of color. And so I'm really excited because for this particular film, we want authentic African and African-American mm. voices. And we don't often get to do that. And so especially with the huge population of Nigerian Americans that are here in Houston, it was really important for me to, you know, to say, hey, here at home, I need y'all to come out. This is an opportunity for us to bridge that gap because sometimes there is a gap between African American artists and African artists. Absolutely. How do we make sure that we tell stories that st are still about the black experience in all of its forms that's diasporic, you know? And so this is an opportunity to do that. And so we have... Two castings. One will happen in Austin, Texas, and that will be um, October 7th. I'm getting that right. And then um, Houston is October 14th. Okay. And so super, super excited. If you are interested um, in in being cast, in, in auditioning, in learning a little bit more, um, you can email casting ITTUB, which is if they took us back. So casting ITTUB at gmail.com is where you can RSVP to audition. Okay. All right. Now, have we left anything out? Because I know right now that's your total focus right now. You're, you're totally into that. You know, whenever I talk to you, I can tell, like, you're highly motivated yeah. by this right here. But yeah. is there anything ancillary on the outside that might be going on that you can? I'm hyper focused right now, but okay. I do want to I do want to say this. Even when it comes to our crew, um, most of our crew and the production company that we that we're working with, which is Mark Finder Media in Austin, they're absolutely incredible. Um, but by happenstance, coincidentally, this this is not um, a film company or production company that is full of people of color. But we're opening up that opportunity for our additional crew to be people of color. And so if there's anyone also who's interested in just oh, wow. coming in and working on the crew and who can be available um, in January of 2024, I welcome that as well. Okay. Um, if there are people who are interested in working as far as music or scores, everyone should get something out of this. You know, I'm like, I'm the person that's saying, like, get a drum or something. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I, you know, I say this all the time to my team and they kind of like giggle at me, but I'm really serious. Like, if, if I'm a, a singer in a band, I don't need everybody to just wait for me to do something. It's like, if you drum and I need you to drum and if you in the back, dance and I need you to dance and if like I want everybody to feel proud of this project everyone I want to take ownership of what we're doing because this film is not about me the film is about it's about us right and it's about conversations I'm so excited about the arguments that people are going to have on the way home from the theater right about okay. what they think and no I don't think it should be this way this like I'm not answering anything. All I'm doing, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm just going to throw it out I'm there. I'm just going to throw it out there. And then I just want y'all to go home and think about how the world would be different, how you would be different, how experiences would be different. What would that even look like for other people of color, right? Um, being black is such an experience, Hatter. When I think about how black people, and when I say black people, I'm talking about specifically like this subgroup of African-Americans, people who were enslaved on this soil and the descendants. We influence the world. We yeah. can go anywhere around the world, and they're they're holding up Wu Tang signs and. <laughs> may, you, do you not understand yeah, what get, I'm saying? Yeah. Like, we have influenced the world. Definitely, we move culture for African sure. African Americans very specifically have shaped fashion, music, this thought, is true. literature, everything. This is true. And so it's so exciting to. I think this is a way to to see how you know absence makes the heart grow fonder. I think we'll learn to appreciate one another by thinking about what it would be like if things were different. And so this is the opportunity for us to have those conversations 
you know, I'm really excited about it. Give me the information again. So if you are interested <coughs> in being cast in If They Took Us Back or auditioning for If They Took Us Back or even being a part of the crew, you can go to castingittub at gmail.com. If you're interested in just learning a little bit more or even donating to the project, you can always um, go to houstonplayonpurpose.com. You can send messages there, uh, make donations, and just find out more about what we're doing. My friend, big timer, Holly Charles <laughs> Pearson in the building. Good luck to you. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you got to do. <laughs> he didn't have that sound effect ready, so. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. Did it myself.